Hello there and welcome to this Spring Framework Fundamentals training course. I'm Richard Chesterwood. I'm a programmer from the UK working for the Virtual Pair Programmers. In this opening chapter, I'll run through how the course works and then I'll give a brief overview of Java EE and where Spring fits into all of this. This is the second edition of our Spring Framework course. The first edition was written way back in 2009 and it was enormously successful. It helped developers all over the world to get started with professional Spring programming. And I hope this second edition can do the same for you. We've released the second edition to bring the course up to date with new developments in Spring. But actually, one of the great features of Spring is that over time, the fundamentals don't change very much. It's quite a stable framework, and that's a good thing. On this course, we're going to take you through all of the fundamental features of the Spring framework. We will be looking at dependency injection, how to wire applications and what that means. We'll see how to access a database. We'll also use Hibernate, JPA and MyBatis. We'll look at aspect-oriented programming and why Spring uses this feature. We'll also look at how to manage transactions in your application and how to do integration testing. A new feature of this second edition is how to use annotations to do wiring. Now this is a controversial feature of Spring that was added back in version 2.5 but has only become popular since we recorded the last edition so we'll have a good look at that. The pattern of this course is that you'll be listening to informal sessions where I describe some fundamental concepts about Spring using a combination of explanations which I'll try to keep as clear as possible, but for most of the time, we'll be writing code. We've tried to make this as close as possible to virtual pair programming as we can. I want you to feel as though you're sitting alongside a developer and you're working together. We're going to be working on two separate systems. I'm going to use this bookstore application as a very basic example just to describe the concepts. When I'm working on the bookstore, you have a choice. You can either follow along with me, I'll be providing you an exact copy of the code that I have on the video, or if you prefer, you can sit back and listen and enjoy the explanations. But there are going to be regular practical sessions where you build your own system. There's going to be eight sessions through the course, and these aren't going to be quick exercises. These will be proper programming challenges. You will be writing for yourself production quality code, or as close as we can get to it, and you'll be working almost from scratch. But if you need help, we provide full worked solutions in the form of pre-prepared code, and we also have video demonstrations. So you can't go far wrong. But if you hit a problem that you're completely stuck with, then we have a support system where one of our support team will help you to get going again. We can't promise to be quick. We usually answer within one or two business days, but we will help you get started again. When you finish, the code will be, of course, yours to keep, and you'll be able to extend it as much as you want. Now, the only prerequisites or the previous knowledge that you need for this course is a reasonable working knowledge of standard Java. You'll need to be able to write classes and to create objects, and you also need to know what interfaces are. If you're quite new to this, then you might find that this course is a great way of practicing the fundamentals. But if you need help with any of this, then we have a Java Fundamentals course that will set you up well for this course. But apart from that, you'll be fine. Occasionally, I'll be using some very simple UML 
that's the unified modeling language, but really nothing more than what you can see here. Boxes representing classes and lists of methods inside. Apart from a few other minor symbols, which I'll explain along the way, that's about as complex as I get. For the course videos, I'm going to be using Eclipse. Now, you can technically use any development environment that you prefer, because we are only going to be using a collection of JAR files for Spring. However, I strongly recommend that you use Eclipse when you're working on the course, so that your screen matches what's on my video screen. That will make it far easier to support you if you run into problems. You can always download Eclipse from eclipse.org slash downloads, and then when you've finished the course, you could move to a different development environment if you prefer. You can use any of the standard or IDE for Java EE developers or the IDE for Java developers. It doesn't really matter. I think I'd probably recommend the IDE for Java developers if I had to select one. Now we supply this course with a complete set of all the software that you're going to need apart from the development environment itself. So if you've bought the course on a DVD, you'll find a file on the DVD called software.zip. Or if you've bought from our website as a download, then follow the My Courses link and follow the link to Spring Framework 2nd Edition. And then here's the full list of chapters and we're going to be studying a lot of them on this course, but right at the very bottom of the list there, there should be one called Practicals and Code. The file name is software.zip, and if you download that, you will have all the code you need for the course. Once you've downloaded and unzipped that file, you'll find the following contents. First of all, there's a practical guide. That's a PDF document that you won't need until you start the practicals later on in the course. And then the three folders, we have a folder called Additional Code. You won't need these until much later. These are just files that I didn't include in your starting code. You'll need the My Battist Jars folder when you get to chapter 27. And you'll need the Managing Books Integration Test when you get to chapter 29. So we won't need those for now. And then there's a folder called Projects at the end of each chapter. Now what I've done here is I've taken a snapshot of my coding environment that I used on the videos at the end of each or at least most of the chapters. So for example, here in chapter six, if you got stuck on chapter six, we'll be working on a bookstore in chapter six. So you could have a look inside there and you can find all the code that was on the video screen. Sometimes we'll be doing some heavy typing on the course and, you know, this isn't a typing course. So if you want to sneak into there and do a bit of copying and pasting, that's fine as long as you understand what's going on. You'll notice that on some of the chapters, for example, in chapter seven, we don't do any particular coding. So I've combined those chapters into a single folder. Oh, and I should say before I leave this, that if you look in any of the lib directories, that's where we normally store the jar files. I've removed all of the jar files from these snapshot folders because it would have taken up too much space. You'll find the jar files, and this gives me a chance to move to the most important folder, this is the starting workspaces folder. Now you have two of them here. When we first begin the course, in chapter two, we work on a very basic system. And I've put that in this workspace called workspace for coupling. If you're new to Eclipse, then when you start up Eclipse, you'll want to navigate to that folder in this dialog box here, and then click on OK but I'll be showing you how to do that when we get there. But just to show you what's inside there, there's a project called Coupling Example, and in there you have all of the source code that you need, and most importantly, in the lib directory are any jar files that you need for that particular part of the course. Well, this is a very basic workspace, there's only a single jar file for that one. 
But when you go to the next chapter, that will be chapter three, we'll open up this second workspace called the message of the day workspace. Now I didn't give this a very good name to be honest. I thought this would just be a workspace for one particular chapter, but then I went on and used it through the rest of the course. So if you want to rename this to something like, I don't know, training course workspace, then that might be a bit more obvious what's going on there. I can't, I can't rename it because I, I carried on recording with, with that workspace name. But in there are four different projects that we'll be building up throughout this course. If we look in the bookstore project, for example, I think most importantly in the lib directory are all of the jar files you need for the course. In particular, here are all of the, there's a lot of them by the way, here are all of the Spring 4 jar files. Now don't worry too much about the structure of this until we get into the next chapters, but I just wanted you to know that those jar files are there. Now you could have downloaded those jar files for yourself from the Spring Framework website, but I've done that for you because they kind of hide away the downloads now because they would rather that you used Maven to build your Spring system. Now, I agree that Maven is probably the best way of managing your jar files or an alternative tool such as Gradle. Now, for this course, we don't want to be dealing with Maven and Gradle problems. So that's why we've given you a folder with all of the jar files you need. Please don't be tempted to start messing around with Maven and those kinds of things while you're learning Spring. Of course, as soon as you finish the course, you could then set up Maven. And if you want more in information on how to use Maven, then we have a full training course on that called Java Build Tools. But while I'm talking about the Spring website, I think I'll introduce you to it. This site has gone through some various incarnations over the years. In fact, the original name for this site was springframework.org. If you go to springframework.org, it will redirect here, which is their new site called spring.io. Now, their intention is that they're gathering together lots of projects related to Spring here. But at the time of this recording, if you follow the link to projects, you'll find quite a few projects on here that are kind of related to Spring, such as Spring for Android, which we won't be covering on this course, we're concentrating on the core, which is this link here for Spring Framework. If you're following this video and you find that their website's completely different, please don't panic. They seem to change it every few months and we can't stop them doing that, of course. But somewhere you will find a home for Spring Framework and we are going to be using the documentation for Spring extensively through this course. And on this page, you will find a link to the reference guide and the API. And believe me, you're going to need it on the course. But as I say, this is where I was leading to. When you finish the course and you want to move across to something like Maven, then you will find all of the Maven dependencies that you need here on their download page. But don't forget, you can get started on this course without any of that because you've already got the jar files available. Just a few words on the versions of Spring, and this might be of interest to you if you've maybe done some work in Spring before. The original version of Spring was released back in 2004. It really doesn't seem that long ago, but it was. And one of the amazing things for me is that even back in 2004, Spring featured pretty much all of the core features from the start. Most of what we're going to cover on this course was present in Spring 1, at least in some form. Some of the features were not particularly well implemented at first, and they've massively improved, but most of them were there. So I think that's great. As a Spring developer, we're able to learn the fundamentals, and you don't have a sudden new version coming out meaning that you've got to relearn everything from scratch. Really all that's happened since then have been a few relatively small changes to the fundamentals and lots of new advanced features. In Spring 2, for example, AOP, 
If you don't know what that is, we'll be studying it in detail on this course. The AOP was dramatically improved. And of course, that's the version of AOP that we'll be studying on the course. Spring 2.5 was 2007. And the really big change in there was annotation wiring. This is perhaps the most controversial change in Spring. We'll be covering this in detail in chapter 22. That could have a big effect on the way you write your code. Spring 3, well, not really a lot changed in Spring 3. Lots of new features, but really the only thing that affected the core features was something called the JPA template was deprecated. If you already know Spring and maybe you've studied the first edition, then this will be a big change for you, and we'll be covering the details of that when we get to chapter 25. And I'll show you what you can do instead. And Spring 4, which is current at the time of this recording, well, do you know it's really quite hard to actually see what's new in Spring 4? I would say it was largely a tidy up exercise Spring 4. They've removed a lot of legacy support for things like old versions of Java. But if you're interested in the exact changes, you can go to the Spring site and check out whatever the latest version of the reference manual is. And one of the very early chapters there is what's new in the Spring framework. And basically everything is listed there. So there's a lot of talk about uh, the, they've removed a lot of deprecated packages and methods. They now support Java 8. And the key thing is that really not much of this affects the core concepts that we'll be following here. And I would very much hope that if you've come across this video and Spring 5 is the current latest version, I'm going to have a pretty big bet that everything or 90% of this course still applies to whatever version of Spring is current at the time you watch this. For the rest of this chapter, I'm going to give a brief background of Spring, where it came from, its history, and how it compares with its big rival, which is called EJB. If you know all of this already, then you can move on to the next chapter and get working. But if you don't, this is well worth watching. Okay, most of it is ancient history, but it will help you to see how the different competing frameworks fit together. I'll spend about 10 minutes on this. We won't need to do any code, but I think it will be useful in some technical areas. Now, if I can sum up the Spring framework in a single sentence, I would say that Spring aims to make Java server development simpler. Now, you might also hear the related term enterprise development, which is a strange and vague word, but for me, that really means applications that need to run on a server rather than a desktop. Just in case you haven't done any Java enterprise development before, and in particular, I'm talking here about the Java EE library. Let's have a quick overview of what that is. When you're developing code to run on a server, we're dependent on tools. Just having a language like Java is not enough. We might need, for example, quite an obvious one, this, a database. But also, we're going to need a bridge to that database so that we can access the database from the code. Now, these things are not part of the language, They're not part of Java. They need to be supplied by some kind of vendor. Now, you might know that Java has JDBC, and that's been in Java almost from the start. But that's sort of been absorbed into the core language. I think it's important to remember that you're still relying on external support from some kind of a vendor. Someone had to write that database and someone had to write the bridge between the Java and the database. Now, on top of that, for a web application, we will definitely need a web server. Well, we'll need a little more than that. We'll need a web server that can run code as well because we're likely to want to generate dynamic web pages. So that's more software support that we need. If you're writing transactional applications, you might need a transaction manager. Now, if you don't know why a transaction manager is important, then 
That will be coming up in chapter 17 of the course. You might need a security system. You might need directory services so that you can publish objects across your entire application. I'm referring there to the JNDI library in Java, which we will be meeting later on in the course. But, you know, as a Java developer, I often feel jealous of Microsoft developers because in their environment, one particular vendor, which is Microsoft, of course, have a very tight control of the entire stack of software. And so accessing all of these things that you can see here in Microsoft is really tightly integrated into their languages. For instance, you can do a lot of these things in Visual Studio using integrated wizards. In Java, we don't really have that luxury because these tools are all created by many different vendors, such as Oracle, IBM, JBoss, and so on. But for many years now, the vendors have been providing these tools, these software services, in single integrated packages called application servers. So an application server is really nothing more than software. It's software that provides server-side services in a single integrated package. Now, for a while, back in about the late 1990s, I said this would be ancient history, we had a very unpleasant situation in the Java community. And that's because if, for instance, you had written your software system using, for example, IBM's WebSphere, then at that time, your code would only run on IBM WebSphere because you were using their API into their software products. Now, the vendors themselves were worried about this because without some kind of coordinated industry standard for Java, getting widespread developer acceptance would have been really difficult. So in response to that, the Java EE standard was created. Well, you might still see it referred to as J2EE, which was the original name for it. It stood for Java 2 Enterprise Edition, but it has now been renamed to Java EE, and you'll find that's now the accepted term. Now, I have to say the term enterprise doesn't really mean anything here. Some people get confused with this and think this is like an advanced version of Java that you have to pay to download, but that's not the case at all. Java EE is a specification specifying the services that an application server must support in Java. So if you buy or obtain, many of them are open source, a Java EE application server, then you know that it will feature a web server that can run Java, a transaction manager, security management, and so on. Also, you know that the API for calling these services is a standard. So in theory, you can change the application server you use without needing to port your code. So really, Java EE is nothing more than a collection of libraries that an application server must support. Actually, technically, it's a group of different libraries. For example, when using an application server, you know that you have the standard RMI library to allow you to call remote methods. Well, it's more than that. It's actually the RMI IAOP library. That's an over-engineered acronym, that one. But that means that you can write Java code on the server and call that Java code from non-Java clients, maybe a Visual Basic client, for example. This uses the mechanism called Corba under the hood. It's a pretty complex library, that, but it is built into application servers. More on that in a moment. There's also a library called JTA built into application servers, and that allows you to write transactions. There are a lot of these. There's one called JNDI for naming and directory services. There's one called JDBC, which you've probably come across. That's for managing databases and has now become part of standard Java as well, but you know it will be in the application server. There are servlets and JSP that enables you to build web pages. 
and there's also the Java Messaging Service or JMS. Now I could go on, there's well over 20 of these libraries mandated by that standard. Now the people who were creating Java EE were originally, and I'm talking now back in about the early 2000s, a long time ago now, they were really worried by this vast number of libraries that application servers contained. They were worried that it would be too hard to learn and understand. So they came up with an idea and the idea was called EJB. Now EJB stands for Enterprise Java Beam, which I have to say isn't a very meaningful phrase. It was really just a label they gave this idea. And if I were to convert this into English, I would say that an EJB was supposed to be an easy way to access those libraries. Let me explain. The rough idea behind an EJB would be that you would write a simple class. Now I have here a regular Java class. It's called a book service and it's presumably a class involved in some kind of online bookstore, for example. Now in EJB, this class would be largely regular Java. By that, I mean you don't have to make any calls to the Java Transaction API or the Java Remoting API. You don't have to worry about any kind of security. You would, by and large, write a regular Java class. The idea then is that you would obtain one of these application servers and then you would deploy the class to the application server. And by deploy, I mean some kind of upload process where you transfer the Java onto the application server. Now, and here was the big feature of an EJB automatically the application server would add features to the class. All the methods would become remote, for example, which would mean that if I were to write a client, it could be a Java client, but it could be a Visual Basic client, it could be a C++ client, I would be able to call the methods on that server without me having to do any special extra work. All of the methods will also become transactional. So with very little work, if something went wrong in any of the methods, all of the changes made to the database would be rolled back. Now, I'm not sure if you're familiar with application transactions yet. We have a chapter coming up on the course, but that's actually quite a complex process to implement when you're working on object-oriented multi-tier systems. All of the features would also be secured, which means that if I wanted to, I could take some or all of the methods on that class and prevent them from being called by the client unless the client had logged in first. Now that was the idea. Back in the early 2000s, I don't know if you were working in Java then, but everybody was mad keen on EJBs. They were the coolest thing to have on your CV. But it didn't work out like that. After about a year or so, people began to realize that EJBs were really complicated themselves. Now, I made it sound like it was an easy process of writing a simple class, but believe me, it wasn't. They were really badly designed, difficult to use, really difficult to write, and a general nightmare to work with. On the first edition of this course, I went through the steps you had to follow to write an EJB. To be honest now, that's too far in the past to, to repeat on this course, but suffice to say they were difficult to work with. I started my career in Java around the time that EJB was happening and it genuinely wasn't nice. Most of our development time in those days was wasted debugging these horrible things. And one of the main problems with EJB was that it was an all or nothing affair. If, for example, all you were interested in were the transactional aspects of EJB, I think basically the committee threw everything they could think of into the specification because they didn't really know what developers ultimately were going to use. This business about the method, all the methods becoming remote and being able to be called from a Visual Basic client back in the 2000s, that sounded like a great idea. But the committee hadn't seen that the web was growing really quickly and that most applications were going to become web applications and therefore had absolutely no use for Corba and Visual Basic client applications. It was hard baked into the specification, so you had to deal with it 
even if you didn't want it. And by the way, that was true for many projects. Many projects want transactions, but nothing else. But with EJB in those days, you still had to deal with the complexity of the remoting features, the security features, and lots of other features as well that you really didn't care about. But also for me, one of the biggest problems with EJB is that it would only run on an application server. Outside of the application server, they were useless. And this made them difficult and very difficult to test or run in isolation. However, EJB was the official standard and many projects felt obliged to use them. Well, in 2002, a software developer called Rod Johnson, and this is the guy here, wrote a book called Expert One-on-One -on -One J2EE Design and Development. Now, this was a really brave book because it challenged the status quo in the Java industry and it asked the question, amongst other things, do we really need these EJBs to make Java development simpler? Is there some kind of better way? And the book tried to answer that question and it featured lots of coding examples showing how really just simple fundamental Java together with good software engineering principles could be used to simplify our development without the need for EJBs. We're still working with Java EE we were still calling those libraries for transactions and all the rest of it, but without using the EJBs. Now, the code that was contained in this book was made available for download on a website, and Rod decided to open source that code. It was under the Apache license. And over time, the code was refined and expanded by both Rod and a group of other enthusiasts. And over time, it became a full-blown framework. And that, of course, eventually became the Spring framework. So we can use the code that Rod and his team supplied to do the same thing as EJB, to access the services provided by Java EE, but by writing simple, plain Java objects. And critically, you choose what you need. If you're only interested in, for instance, simplifying data access, and you can do that, and you only need to do that. If you want transaction management, you would write plain Java methods, and you can make them transactional without affecting your code and without the need to use anything else. And it even becomes the case when you're working with Spring that you might begin to realize that, well, we never really needed an application server anyway. With Spring and a few JAR files, you can often replicate the features that you would otherwise need a massive application server suite to achieve. Now, I find that working with Spring is a bit like choosing from a menu. You only need to learn about and use the features you need. Well, after that book, Rod went on a really amazing journey. He built up from scratch a company which was originally called Interface 21, but then they rebranded to Spring Source to promote and support Spring. But then the company got so big that in 2009, they were acquired by the giant VMware. And they got so big, mainly because a lot of the Java industry went over to Spring instead of EJB. And as Spring grew, Rod's company grew. So that was a bit of a history lesson. And I'm sorry if I bored you there, but I think it's important to understand this history so that you can see how the different frameworks fit together. In the mid-2000s, let's say around 2004, most Java projects were struggling with this terrible official Java standard, EJB. And then Spring came along to become an alternative, cleaner and lighter de facto standard for Java EE. Now, what do I mean by a de facto standard? Well, EJB is an official standard. And it's defined by the JSR process. If you've come across that before, that's the process that standardizes all of the Java libraries. But Spring is a so-called de facto standard. It's defined by a private group of people that was originally Rod and his team, and now it's VMware. But it's supported by a large number of people. 
and it's used so commonly across the industry that you could consider it a sort of unofficial standard, and they're often called de facto standards. Now, because Spring was so successful, lots of projects and developers moved away from EJB and over to Spring. And I remember this time well. I met my first Spring project in 2005, and it was like a breath of fresh air working on it. It was a really great time. But I need to complete this history lesson. The EJB I've been describing so far was the original version of EJB, versions 1 and 2, and that's before Spring came along. But then the committee behind EJB created version 3. Now we do cover EJB on our Java EE with Glassfish course. And it's really amazing how much this course and that course share in common. In other words, EJB and Spring today do pretty much the same things. Now, the thing about EJB3 is that EJB3 is vastly improved. Now, that is thanks largely to the lead that Spring gave them, but that doesn't really matter. The point is that today, EJBs are themselves quite clean and easy to program. So we've got an interesting situation in the Java industry. There are two camps, if you like. Some projects like official standards, that gives a sense of safety and stability. And these projects are likely to prefer to use EJB. Other projects prefer to use Spring. Now there are different reasons for this. Spring is more fast moving. It has more features than EJB. And in some places it is better designed. But to be honest, many projects choose Spring because the project leader or the architect might have used the old, horrible EJB. They've decided never to go there again, and they're sticking with Spring through loyalty. And you know what? That's fine as well. So I'm often asked, which is best to use today, EJB or Spring? Now, I must admit, I have to be impartial because I also train our EJB course and we have a great time on that course as well. But I admit that I still prefer Spring, but only by a small margin. And the main reason is that it's easier to work in Spring, I think, because you don't need an application server. You can use one if you want it, but if you don't want it, then you don't have to have it. That's why on this course, we're going to start with a very simple application and build it up until it reaches the level of complexity that we need. As we go through the course, we'll add in transactions, we'll add in features such as aspect-oriented programming, and we'll do all of this without an application server. But I'll also show you various places where you could integrate with an application server if you wanted to. And the difference is if you're working in EJB, then your first job is always to install an application server. So I like the general philosophy of Spring, which is to keep things simple until you need it. So let's move on to the next chapter. Rod and his team, when they were developing Spring, realized that the dependency on the application server was a real problem. And they developed Spring to make sure that your application is not dependent on its environment. So they use a technique called dependency injection to help make your code independent of the server it's running on. So in the following chapters, we're going to look at all of the major Spring core features. And as we go along, we'll build a full Spring application, but we need to start with that crucial fundamental concept called dependency injection. If you understand that, then Spring is easy. So rejoin me in chapter two for a full discussion of dependency injection.